So, dear guests, I hope you are all well connected now. Uh, I had some technical difficulties, but uh, I hope you are all well connected and as eager for today's discussion as I am. We are now going to start this conference with a small video uh, message from our group president, Irache Garcia. Dear friends, let me first welcome you all to this conference on a very pressing topic for our group. Unfortunately, freedom of expression and artistic freedom are being threatened inside our union and also in our neighboring countries. There cannot be democracy without this fundamental right and we must act to protect them. This is why I am very happy to see a very good program for the discussion today. And I am sure that we, socialists and democrats, will learn from this exchange and improve our efforts to defend these freedoms. A healthy and a strong democracy relies on people having access to objective and honest information. A macho society also needs artistic performances and expressions, especially when they are challenging. Journalists and artists need to be able to work without fear of intimidation, insult or abuse. Both political or economic pressure to censor such freedom should be avoided. At a time of fake news and growing populism, it is more necessary than ever to underline the central role of free and independent journalism. Because we all need journalists to scrutinize, provide facts and research to take our decisions. To perform this crucial role, however, they need adequate resources and there need to be enough pluralism. We should be grateful to artists and journalists for showing us different perspectives and widening our relations. However, the governments of some countries try to limit and control media and artistic through different means. It can be with distorted public advertising, by hiding information, silencing critical and independent voices, or even through the direct control by governments to ensure that they are in line with the ideology of the ruling party. So this is no longer information or Arctic expression, but propaganda. The latest example of this is Poland, which seems to be copying urban techniques to undermine independent media through taxation policy. The COVID-19 crisis has worsened the situation. In many cases, journalists no longer have the freedom to report independent, diverse and reliable information. The creative sector is also under a lot of pressure because the safety measures make it very difficult to many artists to perform. In the second half of 2020, the creative and cultural sectors' financial losing rates is 70%. The EU provides funds to support media freedom and investigative uh, journalists, but it is not enough. We must also guarantee that no single euro of EU funding is spent on any government action that results in a restrictive media. Artists and the cultural and creative sector also need support to overcome the pandemic crisis. Today, we want to listen to you, artists, activists and journalists, to share your concerns and your proposals so that uh, we can try to come up with solutions. I wish you a very successful exchange. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. I would like to thank our group president for contributing to our conferencing despite a scheduling conflict. So, dear speakers, moderators, dear guests, dear friends, I'm very happy you are all virtually connected to this conference today because it is important to pay tribute to those who raise their voices in ever more difficult conditions. And indeed, discussing, discussing attacks to media and artistic freedom has unfortunately become very topical and urgent again. Media and artistic freedom are not an, um, no empty phrases. They are cornerstones of healthy society and functioning democracy, while the emphasis here is on functioning. Only when these two fundamental rights are filled with meaning and exercised freely, media and art can act as, as the all important corrective in democracy. We see with ever shorter intervals that attacks 
on media and press have again in, in, intensis, intensis, intensified in the last years of the pandemic, whether it is openly on the streets or indirectly through structural changes or tax policy. Media freedom is at risk across Europe. And we urgently need to find effective ways to protect better the independence of press and media. I would like to emphasize that these attacks do not only occur in one part of the EU, but are unfortunately quasi-universal phenomena. However, it is happening at a very different degrees of intensity, and we see how these fundamental freedoms have been dismantled from within governments for years, as is, is the, the case in Hungary and Poland. But not only the media must be able to report without restrictions, creatives and artists of all forms of art must also be able to express and perform their art without fear of reprisal or anticipated self-censorship. This applies all the more to art that is directed against government and their action. Artistic freedom is a form of freedom of expression and as such, its limits must be interpreted broadly. The latest report on the UN Special Report Rapporteur on the Promotion and Protection of the Freedom of Opinion and Expression, David Kay, also underpinned this. Therefore, I'm very much looking forward to what our invited speakers consider as causes of action, as you are the ones who work in these circumstances on a daily basis to provide the public with independent journalism and encouraging art. I will give the floor now to our keynote speaker, who is the Secretary General of the European Federation of Journalists. Dear Mr. Ricardo Guterres, the screen is here. Thank you very much for being with us. And I hope we will have a very inspiring discussion, discussion, discussion in this afternoon and we'll find a lot of tools what we can do on a European level to ensure media freedom and also artistic freedom. Thank you very much for being here. You have the floor. Thank you, Petra Kamerovert. Um, Madam President, uh, ladies and gentlemen of the European uh, Parliament, dear colleagues, um, freedom of the press and, and artistic uh, freedom are two essential dimensions uh, of, of one and the same fundamental right, freedom of expression. And this freedom has been under pressure in, in Europe for, for years now. Uh, and the context of, of the fight against uh, the pandemic has not helped, of course. Uh, in the last few evenings, thousands of people have taken to the streets in Spain to support uh, of a rapper, uh, Pablo Hassel. He was taken to prison on Tuesday. Uh, he faces nine months in prison for glorifying terrorism and slandering the crown over tweets and uh, song lyrics. Uh, Amnesty International described Hassel's arrest as a terrible news uh, for freedom of expression in Spain. I believe that no one should face criminal prosecution only for expressing themselves on, on social media, for joking or for, for singing. Um, something that may, may be shocking. Um, expressions that are, are not clearly and, and directly inciting violence cannot be criminalized. Uh, rapper Pablo Hassel has been sent to prison for his tweets. And more and more journalists are facing threats all over Europe. Um, that is the current situation. Uh, since 2015, 15 journalists have been murdered in the EU in the EU just for doing their job. Eight in France, Charlie Hebdo, uh, one in Bulgaria, one in Denmark, one in Malta, one in Poland, one in Slovakia, one in Sweden, and one in the United Kingdom. Impunity remains uh, a major issue. Uh, the EFJ uh, has increased calls for justice for the family of Tafne Caruana Galizia, brutally murdered in, in Malta in 2017. The assassination of Jan Kusiak, killed at home in Slovakia on 21st February 2018, exactly three years ago, uh, is, is another case, uh, another major case of impunity. Uh, 
while the number of murders on, on European soil has stabilized, cases of physical violence continue to increase. Uh, 2020 was a record year. Uh, the Media Freedom Rapid Response Platform, funded by the EU, recorded 245 alerts with 873 attacked journalists and media workers in 22 EU member states. Another monitoring tool, the Council of Europe Platform for the Protection of Journalism, recorded 115 major media freedom violations in 27 EU member states, which is the highest level since 2015. According to our data, uh, nearly one in four incidents uh, resulted in journalists and media workers being physically attacked. On Friday, taking into account the deterioration uh, of the situation, we sent a letter to the President of the European Council, Charles Michel. We told him that European leaders should not wait for another murder before acting decisively. Uh, this is also crucial, crucial to set a worldwide example, which is more needed than never before. In our letter to Charles Michel, we, we warmly welcomed the European Commission, uh, that the European Commission included a recommendation on the safety of journalists in its European Democracy Action Plan. However, um, for this initiative to succeed, it requires the strong support of member states at the highest level. We asked uh, Mr. Michel, and we ask you, to put pressure on member states to adopt concrete measures. Good practices exist. They just need to be applied. Uh, the Swedish government adopted a national action plan in 2018 uh, to defend uh, free freedom of expression. The Swedish action plan is entitled Defending Free Speech Measures to Protect Journalists, Elected Representatives and Artists from Exposure to Threats and Hatred. No other member state uh, has adopted such a plan, uh, despite the fact that they all committed themselves uh, to it by, by signing the Council of Europe recommendation on the protection of journalism in 2016. So Sweden is the only one to have kept it, its promises. Artists like journalists are often confronted with same types of, of laws uh, on anti-terrorism, insult, blasphemy. These laws are used to curtail uh, freedom of expression. At a time when artists and journalists are increasingly targeted, we need to uphold the rights of all actors that are working to maintain the free flow of ideas uh, in all parts of, of Europe. Sorry to end uh, on a very serious note. Um, today is 22 February. On 22 February 1943 in Munich, Sophie Skoll and her brother Hans were executed. Their crime, writing anti-Nazi leaflets and throwing them in the courtyard of the University of Munich. Their trial lasted three hours, three hours. They were convicted of treason and propaganda. They were victims of the criminalization of freedom of expression. I invite, I invite you to think uh, of Sophie and Hans in your debates this afternoon. Thank you for your attention. Good afternoon and welcome to our first panel in today's uh, conference. Uh, it's dedicated uh, to the constantly growing uh, pressure on the media in uh, Europe. The examples are many and the problems are peeling up. What's the current state of play? Uh, how Europe can prevent the deteriorating media environment? And what are the possible solutions? Uh, those topics uh, we'll discuss today with our panelists, journalists from Croatia, Bulgaria, France, Hungary, as well as uh, representatives of the Reporters Sans Frontières. My name is uh, Elena Yoncheva, and it's my pleasure to be a moderator to this uh, first panel. I'm a member of the European Parliament now, but uh, I've, been, uh, I've been spending more than 20 years as a journalist, uh, working as a journalist, so the topic of the media freedom is very, very close to my heart. 
and I'm extremely happy to say that this topic is a top priority uh, for the group of Socialists and Democrats. The conference today, uh, organized by Petra Kamevert, uh, will help us identify the right policy solutions. Media freedom is an absolute precondition for democracy and uh, the rule of law. During the recent years, we have witnessed significant deterioration in the field of media freedom. And uh, we have condemned the violence and the intimidation. We have urged the member states uh, to ensure pluralism and freedom of expression. Still, we have not seen much progress, unfortunately. In some member states, journalists are killed brutally. In other member states, journalists are killed journalism is killed as a whole. One is done uh, with a lot of violence, uh, that is done slowly and systematically. The situation with media freedom is very different in many uh, member states and it's becoming worse and worse every day. In addition, there is a huge gap within the individual member states. It's more than clear that we need to, to introduce requirements for uh, how uh, a convergence because weak media freedom means deficiencies in the rule of law. Having said that, I will turn to our panelists uh, today. As you can see, we have very, very interesting speakers representing different media in different member states. In addition, uh, we have also the Rapporteur Without Borders to give us the overall picture and the current trends in the European Union. And I suggest uh, you make a short uh, presentation and then we focus on the question that our viewers uh, will have. It's important uh, to try to identify concrete proposals that later uh, may serve as a basis for future initiatives that SND could launch. So with this, uh, I'm turning directly to Mr. Pavel Zalai, head of the EU desk in the Rapporteur Without Borders. I already mentioned the huge gap on media freedom that can be noted among individual member states. It's interesting to hear uh, what other trends can be observed in the European Union. It seems to me that although the most horrifying examples come from the Eastern European member states, the old EU member states are also um, not immune. So, Pavel, the floor is yours. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you for the invitation. Uh, can you please confirm that you can hear me and see me well? Yes, Pavel, I can hear you and can see you very clearly. Okay, perfect. Um, yes, indeed, uh, the problems are both in the West and in the East. Although in general, Europe, meaning the EU and the Balkans are best ranked in the World Press Freedom Index, it is still dangerous to be journalist in Europe. Uh, of course, the most serious problem is impunity for crimes against journalists, especially for murders. Uh, here, uh, I will not repeat uh, what Ricardo said, but uh, it is appalling that still the uh, masterminds of the uh, murder of Daphne Karana Galizia and Jan Kuciak are not condemned. European and national institutions, and I'm moving on with uh, the list of problems, are failing to protect journalists from judicial harassment, violence and protests. This is, for example, a problem in Western Europe, online harassment and threats from organized crime, which is the case in both East and West. The media's editorial independence is being undermined by repressive legislation, also linked to the fight against coronavirus, by hostile takeovers from oligarchs. Again, this is a phenomenon we see both in East and in the West. Institutional pressures, meaning especially on public media, and the economic model of uh, the media is fragilized by social media favoring fake news and by unfair distribution of state, state aid. The EU has been failing to protect the right to information and freedom of expression, its fundamental values, and press freedom risks becoming a taboo issue in Brussels. As you know, uh, the procedure according to Article 7 against Hungary and Poland is blocked in the EU Council. And unfortunately, unfortunately, the rule of law conditionality uh, in the EU budget 
does not include press freedom as a criterion. So I'm uh, uh, coming back to, to, to what you said, Ms. Yoncheva, that uh, freedom of press is a condition for rule of law. Well, unfortunately, according to the European legislation, uh, the EU conditional link to the EU budget, it's, it, it's not. Uh, the EU has been so blind to press freedom violations um, of Viktor Orban in Hungary that he has made out of his country a counter model um, in Europe. And today, Hungary inspires and cooperates with Poland and Slovenia uh, on um, limiting uh, our fundamental values. And Slovenia, this is very important, is uh, going to assume uh, the EU Council presidency for six months in July. Uh, now, I'll very quickly try to sketch out uh, 10 recommendations for the EU. The first one is to promote the goal of journalistic freedom and reliable news and information in the EU and in international fora. Second, regulate digital platforms by requiring democratic safeguards for public debate. Today, this is not the case. Third, promote reliable news and information. And uh, fourth, reinforce media sustainability. Fifth, reinforce Europe's rule of law mechanism uh, so that we go uh, from um, reports to uh, recommendations and eventually to sanctions. Six, adopt a directive protecting journalists and media against arbitrary lawsuits, also known as SLAP. Create a rapid alert mechanism for press freedom violations and to protect journalists. And also this, is, uh, this should be a priority for the EU at the UN level where we request the establishment of a special representative for the protection of journalists. Eighth, Harmonize legislation of, on safeguarding the confidentiality of journalist sources. Ninth, reinforce journalist protection against state surveillance. We believe that uh, common rules can be put in place across Europe. And finally, tenth, launch as soon as possible the rule of law mechanism, conditionality linked to the EU budget, although unfortunately it doesn't include press freedom, it can be useful in promoting democracy. Thank you for the floor, and I'm open to, to questions and comments. Thank you, Pavel. It's extremely uh, worrying uh, what you said about the freedom of the media in, uh, in Europe and your conclusion that press freedom is taboo in Brussels is absolutely alarming. Uh, yes, it's still dangerous to be journalist, uh, journalist in, in Europe, and European and national institutions are failing to, to, protect, uh, to protect journalists. Uh, thank you, Pavel. Uh, and uh, now uh, I will give the floor to Karine Barzegar from uh, TV5 Mont. France, uh, France has a well-established uh, legal and institutional framework supporting uh, media pluralism. However, we can witness some ups and downs uh, in the World, press, uh, World uh, Free Press Index. Uh, moreover, uh, recent years saw a surge of threats against journalists, including uh, physical attacks. In addition, uh, currently there are discussions for adopting legislation that will introduce bans on filming police activities. Uh, this can have a negative impact on the work of journalists and journalists, including when it comes to covering protests uh, or possible uh, police violation. And for more information about the current challenges in France, I'm giving the floor to Karine. Karine, can you hear us? The floor is yours. Thank you. Can you um, just, I uh, just want to make sure that you can hear me. Yes. Is that okay? Yes, perfectly. Thank you, Karine. Perfect. Um, first of all, I um, just want to quickly thank you uh, for your invitation today um, on behalf of my union, which is the SNG, the Syndicat National des Journalistes in France, and also on behalf of prof our, uh, the whole profession. Um, as you said, usually the name of France does not really come up in debates and discussions such as this one, uh, since France is meant to be a democracy where all freedoms are respected, including freedom of expression and freedom of the press. But over the past couple of years, um, the use of disproportionate force by French police during demonstrations and in the streets against the citizens and against reporters, against the press, has been extremely, extremely worrying. Um, in the last three months of 2020, um, we have seen also the introduction of new bills, as you said, in the parliament, like the Global Security Bill, 
as well as decrees and other regulatory uh, texts that are rising fears. Their main goal is basically to prevent any photo or video of uh, police or gendarmes being taken in the public space. Um, over the past years, such films and videos and photos have basically documented the work of journalists and investigations on several scandals in, involving uh, these forces. So um, at this stage, you have both international and French institutions who have alerted on this subject and condemned part of these bills or texts. But if these, these texts and bills become law, France will soon be a far less free country than it is right now. The fears of that are that these laws would impose a harsher order. Um, they will ready mechanisms to put down mass protests and tame critical reporting uh, in the press. Um, just to give you an idea of the current situation in France, um, here are some figures. Um, for example, the impact of recent police use of force during the Gilets Jaunes, the Yellow Vests demonstrations in France. We had two people killed, 27 people lost an eye, five people lost a hand, we had 340 head injuries and numerous other body injuries. Um, the violence of these actions have been seen all over the world in videos and uh, to the point where you had both the EU and the UN through its Human Rights Council, um, they had to warn France against its tactics and its use of force. One of the tactics actually is the new, what's called the new SNMO, which is the National Law Enforcement Scheme during demos, which really entraps people, citizens, and especially, especially journalists, and does not allow them to cover properly the event, um, to follow the police forces or gendarmes. Um, as a matter of fact, over the past two years, you had about uh, 200 journalists or more than 200 journalists were prevented from doing their work, according to data gathered by SNG. Uh, our union uh, encouraged 91 reporters to bring their case in front of the IGPN, which is basically the police uh, disciplinary, disciplinary body in France. But IGPN says they have only received 27 cases and basically there's no follow-up. So SNG has stopped advising them uh, to do so. Um, we had also about 20 journalists taken into custody, detained for several hours, sometimes several days, up to 83 hours, I think it's our record. Um, and they're being released without being charged or simply with a reminder of the law, which is actually um, meaningless because it doesn't refer to any specific law. So I would say this is the situation in France today. And if nothing is done, if this global security bill and the bill confirming the respect of principles of the Republic are voted in the Senate in March, um, in the spring, basically, no doubt it will reduce human rights and fundamental freedoms in France, because our freedoms are going to be sort of legislated away uh, to set up a more authoritarian rule with a powerful set of undemocratic tools. Um, and just to finish, if you look today at the Reporter Without Borders Index of World Press Freedom in 2020, France ranks 34. And to give you an idea, 20 years ago, when that index was created uh, in 2002, France ranked 11. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Karine. Uh, France is a symbol of uh, freedom of media and speech. And the fact that we're discussing the current media situation in France means Brussels should uh, act, uh, the European Commission uh, should, uh, even with legislative uh, acts, protect the media freedom and the resolution of media freedom, the European uh, Parliament resolution on media freedom, it's a good basis for, for that. Thank you, uh, Karin. And now, uh, from France, we are going to Bulgaria, where we have uh, media concentration, lack of editorial independence, strong political influence, open propaganda in the media. We can find them all in Bulgaria. Different international organizations, including uh, Reporter Without Borders and the Council of Europe, have warned over the years about uh, this situation in the country. Bulgaria uh, is not only the very last among other member states, but it's behind more than 20 places from other European member states put at the bottom, like Hungary and Poland. But this was not always the case. Uh, 15 years ago, Bulgaria stood proudly at 37th place together with France. 
with France. And now Bulgaria is on uh, 111th place, closer to Congo, Zambia and Afghanistan, uh, closer to them than to uh, European countries. Uh, for what's going on in Bulgaria and how we can stop this trend, I'm giving the floor to Svetoslav Terziev, editorial writer in Sega newspaper, Bulgaria. Uh, Svetlio, the floor is yours. Can you hear us? Yes, uh, thank you, Elena. <clears throat> uh, well, uh, the European Union usually forgets Bulgaria when it expresses concern for media freedom because its attention is focused, as we see now, mainly on Hungary and Poland, and more recently on Slovenia. But Reporters Without Borders Index of Media Freedom shows that the situation in Bulgaria is much more dramatic than in other European countries, because it ranks 111th. For comparison, Hungary is at 89th place, Poland at 62nd, and Slovenia at 30th second place. According to this indicator, Bulgaria ranks not among European, but among African countries such as Mali, Guinea, and Benin. It is the country with which the red zone in the Reporters Without Borders Index begins. The source of the problems has long been known, the monopolization of the media market and strong government control. The process of monopolization began in 2006 with the gradual establishment of the media empire of the oligarch Delampevsky, who is the favorite of the authorities. Explicit and covered government funding, including through the use of European funds distributed through ministries, plays a crucial role in the survival of the media because they are unable to self-finance the free distribution of their products in internet. Currently, there is a process of even greater concentration of the media, but by foreign owners, for whom the government is turning a blind eye to the fact that they are killing at least the last opportunities for free competition on the Bulgarian media market. Operating in the Balkans, United Group will control the media content in Bulgaria from its creation to its distribution. In one day last month, from the owner of largest telecom in the country, the company United Group became the largest media conglomerate created in the history of Bulgaria. This happened after the Commission of the Protection of Competition simultaneously issued two decisions allowing the owner of Bulgarian telecom company to take possession of Nova Broadcasting Group and a number of newspapers previously owned by Delampevsky. Thus, United Group concentrates major channels for the distribution of cable, satellite, and terrestrial television, the largest national television along with several other channels, one of the largest online media groups, four radio stations, and several print media. Excessive media concentration can make independent journalism in Bulgaria even more difficult and increase opportunities for synergy with the state as the new owner's core business is heavily regulated. Thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Svetoslav. Uh, Bulgaria is already in the focus in Brussels, uh, thanks to the resolution of the uh, rule of law uh, for Bulgaria and uh, the, the text of the European Parliament media resolution, uh, you can recognize almost all the negative tendencies in Bulgaria. So I hope uh, uh, not just this conference, but all the work uh, that have done and, and all the work that uh, we are going to do here in the European Parliament will help uh, um, to the media freedom in Bulgaria uh, to resolve the, the, the problems. And now uh, from Bulgaria, we're moving to another worrying example, uh, that is Hungary. In Hungary, like in Bulgaria, the media freedom was put under so many attacks that it seems uh, we are close to the point of no return. Hungary is also on the Article 7 procedure initiated by the European Parliament. On the top of all the problem with lack of transparency of media ownership, like in Bulgaria, as uh, Svetlio said, significant media concentration and uh, intimidation uh, toward a few remaining independent media 
Several uh, days ago, we witnessed in Hungary with the unthinkable. One radio station was shut down and forced off the air. So, uh, for more um, about the current situation in Hungary, I will give the floor to Daisy Sindelar, editor in chief of Radio Free Europe. Daisy, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, and it's a pleasure to join you. I did uh, send a PowerPoint presentation. I don't know if it's going to be part of these remarks. I can certainly talk without slides. I'll just proceed. Um, and to be perfectly clear, I am the editor in chief of Radio for Europe, Radio Europe, uh, Radio Liberty. So I work with uh, news services in 23 countries not just Hungary, but Hungary is our most recent uh, news operation to open up for reasons that you've all elucidated here. I wanted to say just a little bit about RFE by way of background. Um, we are typically, uh, we're entering our 70th year of operations and we typically work in countries where the free press is under threat. We are a cold war organization, meaning we began uh, with the Soviet bloc countries and the Soviet Union and have since expanded into the post-Soviet blocs, also Afghanistan, Iran, Pakistan, um, and the Balkans. But what's been really interesting over the past couple of years is that we're built on the model that we're, our target is to put ourselves out of business. We want to work in countries with the aim of eventually closing down because democratic principles and political systems and a pluralistic media environment will take over. So in a sense, we succeeded. We used to work in Roman Romania, Bulgaria, and Hungary, and we shut down those services once those countries were moving into the EU and NATO. So it's been very shocking, disappointing to see that over the past two years, the need has been there for us to return. So we returned to those three countries in 2019 and 2020. We launched our service for Hungary, for Hungary, rather, in 2020 in uh, September. So it's still a very, very young news organization. It's called Sabad Europa, um, Free Europe. And its mission in Hungary is much like our mission anywhere, which is to serve as a balanced, unbiased source of news, particularly in a country where there's been such severe media consolidation under a single umbrella group. It's worth noting that our organization is, despite our name, we are an American organization. We get our funding uh, through the US taxpayer via a grant from US Congress. Um, this allows our service in Hungary two important considerations. It can operate without any kind of advertising constraint, uh, which is quite considerable in the, the Hungarian market. Um, and our, despite being funded by the US taxpayer, we are uh, editorial independent. Our editorial independence is protected by US law. So our service for Hungary also uh, operates with no editorial constraints. Our operating budget for Hungary is $1 million, which is not enough money for a, a country the size and complexity of Hungary, but it is what it is. So very quickly, some of the things that we've noticed in the early months about what works in this audience for Hungary are digital products. Uh, our past history is in radio, now we're doing digital only for uh, countries we're returning to. And what we've seen is in Hungary is that there is, despite there being uh, broad government funding for the media, that there's relatively little uh, digital literacy in terms of finding new tools for reaching audiences. So what we were very lucky to do was find someone who was a specialist in data visualization. We have launched a lot of infographics and newsletters, things that travel quickly and seamlessly across social media uh, and reach an audience in a way that brings not only national news, but international news. Other things that have worked are human interest stories. And this has been really interesting. There's no shortage of political and top heavy news in Hungary, but what's missing is the human component. So we're not seeking to do cat videos and light stories, but always trying to uh, insert the human portal into political, economic, education stories, et cetera. And that's true not only with first-person narratives from Hungary, 
But what we're finding is audiences are really interested in human stories from Russia, from Belarus, and from Western Europe. They're looking for how uh, different societies approach uh, problems to common civic problems in countries that are nearby and challenged in similar or different ways. They are interested in news on the rising influence of Russia and China in Hungary, and uh, in particular in investigative reporting. And so to the point of today's conversation, one of the most interesting reports we had early on in the life of the service was a leak about uh, news ed editors at the state broadcaster dictating how European Parliament elections were going to be covered. They were telling their journalists uh, which, uh, which candidates to criticize, which, um, which issues to stoke fear about. So that of course would be migrants, it would be LGBT issues, it was climate change, and basically saying, um, in a recording that was part of the, the reporting, if anyone isn't prepared to work under these conditions, you are free to file your resignation. Um, so this, this uh, was quite a bombshell with the, the Hungarian public. It didn't end up uh, with much in the way of concrete results, but it did obviously made it all the way to Brussels as an issue, uh, certainly was raised as an issue among um, parliamentarians and lawmakers in uh, Hungary, unfortunately, without concrete results. So uh, in terms of challenges, you know, it's, it's humbling in a conversation when there is an emphasis on violence uh, against journalists to to be mindful of the fact that in Hungary, of course, the challenge is different. It isn't that uh, our journalists uh, operate um, under an environment where they fear for their lives, they fear for their personal security, but what really has been challenging is that they have a lack of access to ordinary information. And part of that is built into the Hungarian system. COVID is a perfect case in point where the health ministry had, you know, Daisy, it determined. if you can hear me, uh, we have some technical problems. Uh, um, we can't hear you very well. Uh, oh, if, you, if you can just uh, make a pause for uh, 30, 40 sec seconds that we can try to repair our connection. Um, our technicians are giving me the sign that uh, probably we will manage to do this. So uh, sorry for this, uh, uh, Daisy. Uh, I will uh, just um, say that uh, Radio, uh, Radio Free Europe uh, started to go on air, not just in Hungary, but also in Bulgaria. Uh, and the reason of that is because of the uh, terrible uh, situation worsening uh, with the media freedom. And uh, the Radio Free Europe, uh, it's a good standard uh, for, uh, uh, for uh, very professional journalism and very good standard for investigative journalists as well. In Bulgaria, Radio Free Europe uh, made an uh, investigation uh, that has a very big uh, social and political impact. Uh, so the, uh, the, the colleagues are giving me the sign that we can continue with you. The, the connection is repaired. So, Daisy, please go on. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm already winding up, but thank you for that. Uh, the additional information about our service to Bulgaria, which certainly has done some fantastic investigative reporting. So I just wanted to talk a little bit about some of the challenges that we've witnessed in our short. We're not even a half year old in Hungary. Um, but what we are encountering are real roadblocks to information. So COVID has come up as a case in point, and the health ministry has extended a period for uh, reporters to put in requests for information. Uh, you used to be able to get information back within a 15-day period. That's now 45 days. Um, the health ministry determines the, uh, the conditions in which press uh, press conferences are held. There's very little active interaction between journalists and officials. And hospital officials have been made inaccessible. They are told they cannot talk to journalists. Um, with an organization like ours, it's extremely important. We're not opposition media. We're, uh, we're not in one or another political camp. In order to demonstrate that, we have to have access to the full spectrum of political officials and parties. And in a country like Hungary, it is very easy to withhold that kind of access. So try that we may to, uh, to tempt um, people from Orban's camp into uh, 
an objective, open interview, those things are hard to do. And it, it is a tactic that we see repeatedly in all of the countries where we operate, where we are slowly but steadily pushed into a position where we appear to be opposition media simply by virtue of the fact that that being that is the group of people who will speak to us. That's a huge optical problem and something that should be addressed. Um, in a country like Hungary, where, well, you're looking at Club Radio, index, all sorts of issues within the country, it means you have fewer and fewer independent partners. One of the things that works in Hungary, Bulgaria, elsewhere is collaboration and cooperation between independent groups. Um, as they dwindle, that becomes even more important. Um, and then the last thing would be public fear. I mentioned that we take a people first approach to our reporting in Hungary and elsewhere as a way of humanizing and engaging, uh, humanizing the news and engaging with our audience. It's very hard if people are afraid to talk to you. Uh, and that is something that we have encountered in Hungary. I'll stop there, um, but looking forward to further discussion. Thank you, thank you, Daisy, for this uh, detailed information uh, that you presented. Uh, and now, uh, last but not least, I will give the floor to Maya Sever, journalist from uh, the Hrvatska Radio Televizija and president of the trade union of uh, Croatian uh, journalists. Uh, last year, Croatia moved several places in the world um, free press index. However, the independence of the media doesn't seem entirely shielded from political influence. We uh, have witnessed also a lot of slap cases, and in the recent months, there are more scandals filling up, including harassments of journalists. But now let's hear uh, from first-hand information from Maya. Maya, can you hear us? Uh, Maya, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you for invitation. I can hear you, and I also can see you. I hope that you can see me. Uh, uh, and. Uh, now I will start, start in the area of basic protection. Croatia is protect, protecting journalists' profession, labor rights of journalists and standards poorly. Legislation does not ensure the independence of a regulatory agency and public service, the protections of worker, workers' rights and uh, of freelancers, and the freelancers are not well insured. Collective bargaining is not supported. Freelancers do not have reclaimed protection. Journalists are often attacked by slack lawsuits. Local media are under pressure from local politicians and there is not enough public funds and support for journalism. About slap lawsuits, we are very famous uh, with uh, slaps, unfortunately. According to figures, last year there were at least uh, 905 active lawsuits against 18 media outlets and journalists, demanding a total of 69 million kunas. It's around 9 million euros. Since uh, not uh, all media outlets responded to this survey, uh, this figure could uh, be far higher. In um, uh, 2019, according to a survey of Croatian uh, Association of Journalists, there were 1,163 lawsuits ongoing in the country, with the majority making uh, claims for non-material damages, such as mental anguish and uh, tarnished reputation. In Croatia, the majority of these lawsuits against the media are brought by politicians or former officials, as well as uh, business owners, and in some cases, even judges. About weak protection of uh, workers' rights of media employees and freelancers. There is no national collective agreement uh, uh, in Croatia, and collective agreements have been signed only in two media houses. Freelancers have almost no protections of labor rights. In general, the protection of workers' rights uh, is at a poor level. Media houses, especially private media houses, do not support uh, the establishment of trade unions. All through the rights to the trade union association is also mentioned in the Croatian constitution. 
the pandemic also showed how big the problem is uh, protections of freelancers and atypical workers who enjoyed almost no protections of labor rights. In Croatia, leg legislation does not guarantee the independence of the public service and uh, uh, of regulatory agency. Despite the fact that the electronic media agency must be an independent regulator, the members of the Electronic Media Council are nominated by the government according to its unwritten rules of polit political eligibility. Like the election for the leading positions in the agency, the general director of public service, Croatian uh, radio television, is also elected in the parliament. And the change of leaderships is mainly achieved by changing the majority that swings on polit political elections. It greatly jeopardizes the independence of both of the regulatory agency and the public service. And we have problems with independence in local media. Uh, local media is under pressure of local sheriffs. The majority of uh, local media are in the commercial mode uh, of doing business, uh, which also seems to be their main problem. The cap capacity of the lo local economy in Croatia is not so large that it could fi finance media productions through advertising. The local, the local media are increasingly aware of financing media productions through advertising. The local media, uh, um, I want to say that the local media are increasingly aware of financial arrangements with majors and local authorities. In this often completely non-transparent advertising, transactions, uh, uh, the independence of the media is sacrificed in exchange of postponing bankruptcy. The union, Trade Union of Croatian Journalists, has repeatedly asked the government to change the existing model of financing of local media. Such a model of financing bring local media into a relationships of defense of local government holders whose work should be critical questioning. So this is the few uh, problems, few issues, uh, maybe biggest uh, problem uh, in Croatian media right now. Thank you very much, Maya, for your presentation. Uh, not enough financial support for independent media, local media under pressure of local authorities, so-called local sheriffs, uh, all those problems. Uh, uh, we can witness in uh, different uh, Central and East, uh, Eastern European countries. Thank you very much uh, for uh, these very interesting uh, presentations, colleagues, and the very good uh, basis for starting our question and answers part. I know that we have received a great number of questions and we'll try to cover as many as possible. Let's start with some questions coming from our registered participants. Uh, I see that uh, Tanya Fayon is with us. Uh, Tanya is one of the most experienced SND members, third term in the European Parliament. She is also a former journalist and the leader of the Socialist Party in Slovenia. And currently, the media situation in Slovenia became another reason of concern. Uh, Tanya, please, the floor is uh, yours for one minute. Thank you very much. One minute will be very difficult to describe a very challenging media situation in Slovenia. You know well that um, last week we witnessed uh, Slovenia's Prime Minister Janez Janša harassing uh, Brussels journalists on social media because he did not like simply her reporting. Another the downturn in press freedom in Slovenia. And you heard before, my country is going to assume the EU presidency in the second half of this year. I regret to observe that uh, the most alarming case today is perhaps exactly Slovenia. And uh, before Slovenia takes over the presidency, let me remind that the country prime ministers uh, Jansha has called attention and regular press coverage in several international media ranging from the New York Times and the Guardian, Politico to CDF. Regrettably, the news are not good and for the majority of citizens of Slovenia, they are highly embarrassing. 
And according to the survey um, of the European Parliament, more than 79% of Slovenian respondents find that Slovenia is going in the wrong direction. This is the most of all EU countries. And since Eva Jansha came to power 11 months ago, the international community could uh, read international press reporting on Slovenian backsliding on democracy, government abuse of power, congratulations to Donald Trump, launch of war against culture and repeated attacks on news media that Jansha considered biased. Whenever there is a media about a report about any misuse of power or any criticism of Jansha government, both Orban and Jansha launch an ad hominem attack against the journalists. And all of a sudden, the discussion is not on the misuse of power anymore, but on the journalists under attack. Their aim is very clear, first discredit and then to destroy and eliminate. Now, I mentioned few of the cases, but um, what is more concerning just now is exactly um, the stories around the Slovenia national broadcaster press agency. For example, the funding for public media is cut for the national press agency. In December 2020, Jansha government suspended the funding of the Slovenian press agency. And just today we are receiving the news. Um, it's not really officially uh, confirmed, but it's a website that is open. After many attacks on the national press agency, it seems that Jansha's close collaborators founded national press agency, press agency where many far-right opinion leaders will publish their side of the stories. When it comes to the national public broadcaster, there is another public media constantly under attack by Jansha. This is our RTV company in Slovenia back in spring last year. RTV Slovenia reported on a pay rise for ministers in pandemic and Jansha told to broadcaster to stop spreading lies. We pay you in these times to inform and not to mislead the public. He blessed it and there are too many of you and you are too well paid. So there is a lot of discreditation um, and a lot of attacks to journalists. Um, we have saying that the government is um, carrying out the war against press in Slovenia. And of course, um, also um, the same concern on one of the biggest newspapers in Slovenia, Delo. And there were some um, Jansha fires of tweets accusing Delo of serving deep state tycoons and adding the hashtags fake news and prostitution. So there are, in the last few months, several international organizations, not only journalist organization, but also OSCE and Council of Europe that have expressed concern at the attacks on journalists, but the government has dismissed them with baseless accusations. It insists most mainstream media is part of the legacy of the totalitarian communist past and that Jansha is entitled to call attention to irregularities and abuses when taxpayers' money is at stake at the public broadcaster. So I have to say that the media situation is extremely worrying and deteriorating in my country. And I strongly believe as a former journalist, as a politician and as a person, Slovenian, that the freedom of speech, freedom of thought and the freedom of the press are really the core values of our democratic society and also the core values of our social democratic party in Slovenia. And we have to ensure and do everything also um, at today's conference and all our discussions, it's our obligation to promote media pluralism in the European Parliament, in our European countries, institutions, and support independent journalism throughout the European Union. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tanya. You started your presentation with the case how the Prime Minister, your Prime Minister, uh, was attacking by words uh, journalists. Uh, this is a very bad sign of uh, media freedom and unfortunately it's becoming a tendency because we can see similar cases in other uh, European countries. So thank you very much for this detailed uh, and so valuable uh, presentation, uh, Tanya. And I see that we have online uh, Mr. Vladislav Maximov uh, from Euroactive. 
He's uh, the network regional coordinator for the Balkans. Uh, Mr. Maximov, uh, the floor is yours for one minute question, please. Thank you. Um, uh, despite my title, I actually cover both the Balkans and Hungary. And so I guess my comment slash question is about Hungary. I think one thing that gets very often forgotten about is the fact that Hungary used to have a diverse media market after the fall of, so uh, of the Soviet Union, a lot of uh, Western media conglomerates moved in. So how did we move from there to today, where obviously uh, there is a huge concentration of pro-government uh, voices? And well, after the 2018 financial crisis, the regulatory environment changed, and with coupled with global trends like loss of advertising revenue to tech platforms, there was a first fertile ground for the bulldozing of editorial offices. Um, that's what Fidesz did. So something similar we see slowly happening in Poland with the government calling for a majority Polish ownership of the media market. And at the same time, there we can see that the United States has exerted some pressure to protect the interest of American companies uh, like Discovery as TVN, the country's biggest independent news uh, TV broadcaster. So my question is, do Western media giants bear any responsibility in what is happening in Central Eastern Europe media market and its ownership structure? Why have we not seen similar pressure from the likes of Germany to protect its companies like Axel Springer, uh, ProSieben, Satain, uh, Funke Gruppe, et cetera? And how can we ensure that the big Western media conglomerates that remain in these countries, uh, and not just media conglomerates, but also retail chains like Aldi and Lidl, spend their advertising budget in a way that actually protects the independent media market, especially when they're fighting against government funding uh, towards um, pro-government media, as is the case in Poland, as is slowly happening in uh, Slovenia, and as, as we've just heard, and ob obviously the case is in Hungary. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for, uh, uh, for this uh, question and position, Vladislav. And now I can see that there is another uh, colleague, member of the European Parliament, asking for the floor. My uh, colleague, uh, Peter Vitanu from Bulgaria. Um, Peter, please, the floor is yours for one minute. Thank you, Elena. I hope you can hear me. Just This is more or less like a general remark because what I've been seeing is a very dangerous tendencies. Mixed together, they create deadly weapon for the um, free media. Now, on one hand, we have the COVID crisis, which reduced the income from advertisements in the private media, which made media more or less, I would say, more dependent on the European funds or uh, state funds or on uh, regulatory bodies distributing these funds. At the same time, we have special COVID legislation which facilitates or even allowed the media to release journalists uh, who are no longer protected by the law. We also have a tendency of consolidation and merging of media, which reduce the number of players on the market, which actually facilitates the possibility to in intervene in the content of the media or to influence uh, by the governmental forces. And finally, we are also witnesses another global uh, tendency. Mobile operators are buying media, which allows them to basically to have access to every single person uh, with content they choose. So to me personally, the, the general aim of the media is change from informing the population, the people, to controlling the information and controlling the, the content. And all these dangerous phenomena created a really thrilling and I would say terrifying environment, which turned the media into a propaganda weapon, rented out to a government, especially in the Eastern countries and especially in my own country, Bulgaria. Thank you, Elena. Uh, thank you, uh, Peter. And now I give the floor uh, to our panelists for answering the questions that were raised. Uh, very in top important questions, topics. Uh, uh, I, I know there is no simple answer, but anyway, uh, maybe Pavel uh, Zalai would like to take the floor. Pavel, can you hear us? Yes, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, Pavel, please. The yes. floor is yours. Okay. Uh... Uh, thank you. I will try to respond to the question of Mr. Maximo. Um, so how can we ensure that uh, um, the new, uh, sorry, uh, how can we, uh, you know, what, what the big uh, Western companies 
can do well. Uh, of course, they have a responsibility when they sell their assets to local owners, to local oligarchs. Uh, I think it is important for them to insist this, that uh, on two points. The first point is that this transaction is um, transparent so that journalists in these media are not surprised um, uh, by who the new owner is. This uh, has happened, for example, in Slovakia, also in France. And the second point is that they try to um, transfer to the contract some guarantees of editorial independence. Because uh, more important than who the owner is, it's um, the question of if editorial independence is direct respected and ideally we should come to a point when whoever the owner is you know it doesn't matter because the editorial independence is uh, respected journalists are really working independently um, on the uh, on this issue we have an initiative it's called the journalism trust initiative it's, it's a set of standards we have developed with big media like the guardian uh, afp and others uh, to um, uh, set up standards of journalistic ethics uh, and audit. And today, uh, this, this initiative is, is moving forward under the auspices, sorry, auspices of uh, European uh, normalization uh, system. And uh, this is an opportunity for the media to make an audit of their, of their independence. And finally, I, I will end uh, with this point regarding Hungary, especially. Of course, Club Radio is uh, really the, the, the latest case, um, unfortunately, of um, uh, uh, press freedom being uh, oppressed in Hungary. And uh, you know we really need the European Union and especially the European Commission to use its, its competence. So um, the European Commission should investigate uh, on the independence of the audiovisual regulator, the Council of the Media in Hungary. Um, it should uh, investigate on the use of public advertising. This has come up uh, several times um, uh, during the last hour. Um, uh, it, it, it's a form of state aid, uh, and often it is used illegally, uh, non-transparently, unfairly in Hungary, but also in Poland and other countries, as we have heard. And finally, and this is very important, uh, European Union really needs to improve the regulation of the social media so that social media promote reliable information on one hand and promote sustainable media uh, on the other hand. Because today, uh, true information, reliable information from a serious media has the same value on the social media as a hoax about coronavirus. So, and when we see today in Hungary and Poland uh, all kinds of pressures against the media, we see them moving on to the internet. This is also the case of Club Radio. And so the, all the more this question of uh, regulating social media to promote reliable information and sustainable uh, media production is, is important. Uh, yes, uh, Pavel, and uh, maybe you can also comment on what uh, Tanya Fayon uh, just said. What are the possible uh, measures mm -hmm. when uh, the Prime Minister is on the top of the attack? Uh, do you have some comment on that? And uh, later, Daisy, if you can uh, join on the question on Hungary. But first, Pavel, uh, mm -hmm. regarding uh, the Prime Minister yes. attack on journalists. Yeah, thank you. V very, very briefly. Uh, we have denounced the text of Mr. Yansha against uh, Lily Bayer from Politico, but also before against other journalists, against Slovenian journalists. Unfortunately, we observe an attempt to change the institutional setup to follow the Hungarian path uh, regarding press freedom in Slovenia. Uh, it is really important that when the Slovenian prime minister attacks journalists, um, that uh, European leaders speak out. The European Commission speaks out, the commissioners, especially the EU Council representatives, for example, this time it's, it's, uh, it's the Portuguese presidency and uh, the, the, uh, the European Parliament members. So uh, this is important to, 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 to denounce these attacks. As for the institutional uh, changes, they are not uh, really uh, clear yet. We have uh, heard that the funding of the National Press Agency has been suspended. This is, this is very serious. But um, I think uh, 
uh, it's really important also for the groups, the political groups in the European Parliament to put pressure on their members. So this is the case of EPP and Mr. Jansha, and also this is also the case of European socialists in Slovakia and in Malta. In Slovakia, the most serious attacks against journalists come from the former prime minister, Robert Fico. Also, although we see attacks also from the new prime minister, but uh, Robert Fico is still the most aggressive. And in Malta, of course, it's the issue of, um, of condemnation uh, and transparent, um, transparent uh, investigation of the murder of Daphne Karana Galizia. So the, the, the pressure of the peers in the political groups is also very important. Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you, Pavel. And uh, Daisy Sindelar, would you like to join regarding the question uh, on Hungary? Uh, sure. I, I, I'm not sure that I can improve upon some of the suggestions that Pavel has made, but I can certainly emphasize some of them. He mentioned these trust initiatives, and I think that is something that's really exciting and important um, in the next uh, years and decades ahead. Um, traditionally, journalistic organizations have held their editorial policy as a matter of a close hold or somehow something that needed to be kept discreet. In fact, media organizations have a tremendous power in being transparent about their editorial processes and policies. And there's a solidarity of purpose to be found in more media organizations joining forces on, uh, on projects like these trust, trust initiatives. Because RFE works not only in places like Hungary, but Central Asia and Russia, where it's a much more rough and tumble environment, we are increasingly looking at trust initiatives as a way to convey to our public critics and trolls that we have nothing to hide. And I think that that is a really important way that journalistic organizations can kind of stick together and, and speak with a louder voice than they might individually. Uh, again, the mention of the advertising bases, I think that's quite critical in a place like Hungary where so much uh, advertising advertising drives the, the state media machine uh, and advertisers are basically pushed into that market. Anything that can um, diversify uh, the allocation of advertising revenue or mitigate the dependence on advertising, I think, is important. And then finally, um, a little bit more transparency when it comes to individual NGOs that may be coming to Brussels for funding on press freedom projects. I think that uh, someone quite rightly used the phrase that Hungary has developed a, a sort of a countervailing media model within the EU. And they're quite, they're quite clever about the way that they, they can create different NGOs and different bodies that interact with the EU, um, but very often will take funding meant for uh, transparency or uh, pro uh, press freedom purposes and uh, and use them otherwise. So I think that there's a lot of um, opportunity to be had with cross-border collaboration, different partnerships, bringing different journalistic groups together, but the funding channel and the funding model has to be absolutely transparent to the public and to the user teams alike. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Daisy, for this uh, detailed uh, presentation again and answer. And now I'm uh, turning to another member of uh, the parliament, Mr. Lukas Kohut. Uh, Lukas, uh, please, you have one minute. You can take the floor. Uh, thank you. Thank you for the floor. I would or, or I should rather say thank you for the screen. Um, we all know that uh, media freedom is under renew. Uh, assault in uh, Central Europe, uh, but not only there. Um, the latest examples in Hungary, independent club radio taken uh, off air. In Poland, a newly proposed tax uh, on the media advertising revenues and taking uh, over um, of regional papers and uh, local weeklies by a state controlled company called uh, PKN Orlen. Uh, in Slovenia, Prime Minister harassing a journalist on social media because of her reporting about the downturn in press freedom in that country. Um, as a European federalist, um, I would like to say that we need to act at the EU level. I think the, the Union should urgently increase funding for independent investigative uh, journalist projects. The media action plan presented by the Commission uh, in December 2020 should look at projects through the lenses of uh, strengthening media freedom. 
last but not least uh, the rule of law the rule of law mechanism it should also be extensively used to defend especially smaller regional uh, broadcasters thank you very much uh, thank you, uh, thank you, Mr. Lukas. Uh, uh, I'm turning again to our panelists for answering the questions. But if you allow me uh, a question from my side, uh, a question to Mr. Pavel and a question to Katerine uh, regarding Bulgaria. Uh, in Bulgaria, the situation with the media freedom is um, more like a caricature. Uh, the Bulgarian Prime Minister find a way to replace the press conferences in meeting with uh, journalists. Uh, our Prime Minister, from his car uh, driving uh, in the country, is making comments and everything is live streamed. And uh, a few weeks ago, he said, I'm quoting him, I don't invite media anymore. I will not waste my nerves. I can live stream on Facebook from my car. Uh, this was a quotation. So, uh, Pavel, when a prime minister of a European country refused to give interviews uh, to journalists, uh, what can we do in this situation? What's your comment? And uh, my question to, uh, to Karine is, uh, what will happen uh, with a French politician, a French president, if he say, I don't invite media anymore, I will not waste my nerves? I can live stream on Facebook from my car or from where it is at that moment. Thank you. It's a hard question to answer. Um, not sure what would happen if he decides to do such thing. I mean, over the past couple of months, we've already seen that our president is using various kinds of um, media he's not only counting on traditional media let's put it that way he's also using more um uh digital media or turning into medias that are um young media per se um i don't think it would go to the extent where he will actually not use media anymore but what is sure is that there is there are tensions between uh journalists and the current power in france that um tensions that have been uh, also highlighted by uh, foreign media. And I, I believe the New York Times had a couple of articles and editorial pieces that also um, were um, not very, um, the, the Elysee were not, was not very happy. They kind of displeased um, Emmanuel Macron. Um, I wouldn't, I mean, I wouldn't think it would get to such an extent, but it's a slippery slope, let's put it that way. I mean, slowly and surely, um, the, uh, the the way the, the media used to work in France with the government and with the president is changing. And um, obviously not to the, you know, not to improve. And um, the fact that we are also uh, just before a presidential election in 2022, and that we have, as you know, uh, a strong far right um, party in France, um, I think the president is also gearing towards that uh, in order to, you know, preparing for the next presidential election. And um, that is also creating some tensions between uh, in, in the media per se, um, with the changes of, let's say, power play in several medias that are also have been bought. And we talked about concentration of media or the fact that some medias are changing hands and being bought by, um, by um, let's say, um, businessmen. We've had that as well, and it's all changing both. Basically, the way our uh, government and president is acting with the media and also the face of the media changing in France before uh, this uh, deadline of the election of May 2022. Uh, 2022 yes, it's, it's sort of um, disturbing the way uh, the media would uh, work in France on a usual basis. And I guess, I mean, if, if uh, you have this... Um, scenario of the president using only Facebook, I don't think it will work in France. I don't think that the press would stand it. I don't think the, the French audience would accept it, but that's maybe me because I'm a journalist and I tend to believe that people still want a right, good press, but maybe not, I have no idea. I mean, uh, with uh, social media, um, and I don't like to say social media, I'd rather say social networks because they really like file sharing networks um, when we talk about Facebook or uh, Twitter, if, if um, they, 
you know, uh, take the power, uh, it's going to be very difficult for our democracies everywhere, not only in France, but I would say uh, everywhere in Europe and the world. So I don't know if I've answered your question. It's hard for me to to uh, put myself in that dystopic uh, kind of uh, position. Thank you very much, Karine. Pavel, would, would you like to, to take the floor? Yes. Um, so uh, on the question about uh, Bulgaria, yes, indeed, in Bulgaria, we have a accumulation of um, all the press freedom problems in Europe. This is why it's ranked the worst in the EU. Um, what you told, uh, what you said about Mr. Borisov, it's almost hard to, hard to believe he said that, but I guess it can be explained by the, um, uh, uh, by the approaching um, the parliamentary election. I think that uh, Bulgarian journalists should counter uh, act. Uh, they should um, try to make uh, out of the um, uh, press freedom uh, a, a topic to, dis to be discussed before the um, national election in, in uh, April. And RSF is preparing um, actions and recommendations um, and will try to, to help Bulgarian journalists to make this uh, a pre-electoral issue. Um, Regarding other actions, maybe, as I said already, uh, the political group of uh, EPP should uh, demand explanations from Mr. Boriso, should try to maybe show him uh, how it works in other countries with press freedom. And um, finally, what is really important is the unity of the media. I know that uh, Bulgarian media space is very polarized, but the, the media that uh, have the same values of journalistic ethic should cooperate. And we have seen what happened in Poland. Uh, the, the government um, uh, proposed a tax on advertising and there was a unilateral um, disagreement, uh, you know, showed by the black screen um, of about 40, 50 media, including the media that was mentioned that was bought by, by Pekka and Orlan, a uh, state controlled company. And so, now the Polish government is going backwards and uh, there is discussion inside the government and it's possible that finally the tax will not uh, be voted. I'm being optimistic here, but we can see what unity of, of media can, can do. Thank you, thank you, uh, Pavel. And uh, at the end, uh, we received a lot of questions dedicated to the media freedom uh, about the role of the Commission, the need of European um, public media. So one question from Laura from Romania. Can the European Parliament push the Commission to make use of financial tools to ensure that the freedom of speech, of media and art is on health and uh, if you make it the conditionality for receiving funds, maybe totalitarian leaders will think twice before silencing a journalist. And another question is, uh, uh, are we in need of an independent European public media net that embraces all possible ways of giving trusted info to the population and at the same time make Europe more present in daily European issue and discussions. So if you can give a quick answer to those questions. Pavel, if you want to, uh, to add uh, sorry, something. Sorry, sorry. Yeah, um, uh, can you please, um, uh, you know, direct me to one of the questions because there, yes, there are several uh, questions. Yes, this is about the, the need to, uh, do you think that we need a European public media that can give trusted information to the Europeans? Well, that's a difficult question. I think we have some kind of uh, European public media Unfortunately, uh, we don't have really a uniform European uh, public debate space yet. It's, it's, very, it's very small. Um, you know, national publics uh, work with their national media spaces. Um, I think uh, before we, we think about establishing um, uh, European public media uh, properly uh, set, we should guarantee the independence of the existing national um, public media, uh, and this is uh, a big problem uh, in Hungary, in Poland, in Bulgaria, of course, also in the in the uh, their attacks against the independence of public media in the Czech Republic. 
Um, but also uh, we have seen issues with the public media in Sweden, for example, which is very well ranked in our press freedom index. And the parliament refused to uh, inscribe the independence of the public media in the constitution. So I think this is what we should focus on at, at this point. Thank you. Thank you very uh, much for this answer. I want to thank all our panelists and uh, viewers for the interesting debate. We need urgently to identify measures at a European Union level to prevent further deterioration of the media environment in the European Union. SD Group will propose certain solutions and we will use your output today in shaping our next steps in this regard. And I thank you all for being so open in, in uh, your interventions and answers. With this, uh, I'm closing the first panel and I pass the floor to my colleague and friend, Dominic uh, Ruiz uh, de Veza, for another interesting debate in the second panel of our conference. Uh, Dominic, uh, it's time for the second panel. And once again, special thanks from my side and uh, goodbye. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, um, Elena, for, for your moderation and your uh, work of leading this, uh, this seminar during the, this first, uh, yes, thank you, this first uh, section uh, devoted to media uh, freedom, media under pressure, and now uh, we move on to the other uh, half of the uh, apple, if we can put it that way, the, the question of artistic freedom, huh? because we know also arts are under pressure. And um, I think, uh, we think from the SMD group that this is a timely moment to discuss this, um, this topic. The work of many artists uh, intends indeed to challenge us and make us reflect on the social boundaries. This is the power of art. This might be uncomfortable, but this is a good thing. This has contributed to advance um, democracy. In recent years, we have seen, for example, cases of LGTBI artists uh, put on trial in countries like Poland for uh, offending uh, religious feelings. There are other examples of uh, artists that have been um, persecuted for uh, using satire uh, on the, the institutions or on the government, uh, for criticizing um, the, um, uh, the party in power. And uh, this is obviously unacceptable. Huh? Uh, no, one is, um, uh, no one is free from criticism, whether it's the government, the political class, uh, the church. So we are very clear about that. Uh, at the same time, uh, we have also to debate uh, on the question of hate speech, which is coming out also uh, in some expressions uh, uh, from, from people. Um, this is, I think, a more complicated issue than the previous one, the one regarding satire or criticism. Uh, there are laws against uh, hate speech. Um, questions like um, defending um, fascism or national socialism or anti-Semitism, even in songs, is clearly a problematic issue. Or also um, making apology of terrorism. So I'm sure we will be addressing those topics. But in the end, what this is telling us is that um, we have to defend and protect artistic freedom, while at the same time we have to be conscious that um, the right of uh, expression, the freedom of speech, uh, has limits like any other right. So um, I'm not going to make this introduction longer. I think it's better to hear from uh, the experts, uh, the panelists. So I'd like to, to give a warm welcome uh, to Esrika, Esrirak Plipat, Executive Director of Freemius, Esther Orban, co-president of the Hungarian Dramaturgs Guild, Clement Dvornik, chairman of the Slovenian Federation of Filmmakers uh, Guild, and to accompany us in the discussion, we have also as discussant, uh, Tere Badia, secretary general uh, of Culture Action Europe, the umbrella organization that represents all cultural sectors at the EU level. 
of course, we have also, and I thank them for that, uh, our digital audience following us on Facebook, uh, Twitter, um, and they can also ask questions through the chat box, and I will relay them to our panelists in order to have a, an interactive discussion. So, without further ado, I'm glad to uh, give the floor for uh, a first uh, intervention of uh, four minutes uh, on the situation of artistic freedom in Europe and the latest developments in the different legal frameworks at EU level to Esrirak Plipat, Executive Director of Freemius. Okay, uh, it's been told that uh, Sridak is not uh, available at the moment, so we can uh, move on to the next speaker. We will come back to Sridak, um, to Esther, Esther Orban, if it's connected, the co-president of the Hungarian D Dramaturgs Guild. No, not connected either? They are not connected? None of them are connected? I am. I am here. Uh, Esther. Okay. okay, go ahead, please. Okay, and, and also um, the, the president of the Hungarian Theatre Association, Laszlo Kesek, is also uh, available online. So after I speak, he would like to make some uh, comments uh, on that. Um, so basically, um, I would just like to give an overview of the situation um, in, in Hungary on sort of the, um, the, the freedom of arts and especially uh, theater. Uh, so we have to say that and there's no censorship um, per se. Um, the important aspect of what is happening is that all the pressure experienced is applied through seemingly democratic, however emptied, procedures. Uh, first, we can uh, experience that in the passing of laws, um, if a new law is submitted by government, it has to be exposed to social debate and impact assessment with enough time allocated to both. The moment it is submitted not by the government, but by a single MP, None of this is compulsory. Uh, the second um, important thing is that all bills have to go through special committees. The normal procedure is at least a 30 minute discussion on, on, on every a bill. The moment a composite bill is submitted, the minimum of uh, this half an hour discussion time drops to a minute and a half. And the composite bills are also used as a play of hide and seek. Uh, very important issues can be buried, details can be missed. Uh, there's no time to call experts in. So the system is running on, on empty. There is no discussion and no uh, transparency. And this is uh, partly what happened in uh, with the theater bill in uh, December of 2019. Um, the result of which is the local governments have to reach an agreement with the government to be eligible for uh, state subsidy uh, for their theaters. Or they can decide not to uh, receive any funds from the government itself, only from local governments. And that is, uh, um, in, in some cases, that was the decision uh, made in order to secure artistic freedom for the theaters. Um, so this argument, uh, in theory, is a valid request, given that the, the ratio um, of funds, 50 to 80 percent of the funds, come from the government. But uh, among the rules for, for choosing um, the directors of theatres, there's a, a built-in majority in the setup of the professional and theoretically independent board 
that evaluates the applications and that works in the government's favor. So the local government and the employees uh, of the theater have very little say in the outcome. And when the local government insists on the, the applicant that they, they feel or see is the best for the community on an artistic level, uh, this is where the, the ultimate measure kicks in. The government says, of course, it is your democratic right as a local government to choose the theater director you prefer. But in that case, we cannot offer the city the cultural funds we previously agreed upon. So that's the, the freedom of choice is there on paper, but not in reality. This trait of financial pressure is, is also evident um, in the treatment of the, the independent theater scene, uh, especially in uh, during the on ongoing COVID-19 pandemic, the, there had been no funds allocated to the, um, the independent theater scene. And it's uh, also present in the, the restructuring of higher education, which also includes artistic uh, education. Um, I'm sure uh, a lot of you have um, heard and, and followed the story of the University of Film and uh, Theatre and Film in Budapest, where uh, the, the issue of uh, educational uh, and artistic freedom and autonomy was also pushed into uh, a political and deeply ideological um, debate. Um, the whole thing started with a defamation of the institution. It's a 155 year old organically um, evolved uh, institution and, and suddenly that there were attacks from uh, all over on, on the aesthetics, on, on claiming that there was uh, ideological uh, education uh, as opposed to artistic instruction. Um, so everything- uh, Esther, you uh, have to, con to, to, to start concluding. Okay, yeah, uh, so th that's it. And, and I would like to, um, I hope, there is time for a couple of amendments from Laszlo Kessig on the, the actual... Uh... Okay, I allow it. Yeah, okay, thank you, so. Thank you. Honored delegates, in the name of our organization, the Hungarian Theatre Association, thanks for the invitation. Uh, I'm here as a civilian who can maybe tell you facts about the state of the theatre sector in my country. During my active years, during my adult life, the cultural sector in Hungary was never in such extreme situation as nowadays. The cultural sector is unequal, a side treated and deprivated condition. It's fundamental to understand that this is not a special case or cases what you're looking at. This is a process which follows its internal logic. These are system wide events. It's also important to understand that this is happening in Hungary, of course, but this could happen in other countries too. That's why you have to watch it very, very carefully. In many cases, you can discover the same motives. And now in my speech, because of the time frame, I will talk about only one motive, and that's that the government always, always claim that they have nothing to do with the conflicts and sequels. They, the conflicts are always between private companies, between private individuals or, or organizations, and the government would like to help or interfere, but they are, there are the laws and rules and they can't do anything. They can only watch it from the sideline. In the case of the University of Theatre and Film, which is very important for me, they also say that that's an internal case, artistic, human question. They say that these individuals have to solve their problem. They can't do anything because it's not, this, it's not state university. But let's not forget, they made a university's tradition. They behave as if they weren't the ones who turned this institution into private institution. The main topic is the, that the public money transfers into private money, private company money. And one of the pillars and one of the legs of this transition is the money from the EU Next Generation program. 
The formal state oversight transforms into informal oversight. The Senate of the, Senate of the university does not, does not have the right to elect its own rector. Controverse privatization. The center is the advisory board. Nobody can recall the advisory board. The state is not exercising founding rights because they give it to the board. The, the state doesn't practice maintainer rights because they give it to the board, but the state finances the private institution. Non-professionally, you, you can, you, I can explain to you, I give you my house, now that's yours, but I still pay the bills, the gas and electricity. And one last fact for me, to make you understand how unequal is the system and the situation in our country. So uh, as I told you, I represent the Hungarian Theatre Association and our organization gets uh, uh, an annual subsidy for, for a year and it's one million for it. The other organization, the MTT, uh, which is, which is uh, the close uh, organization to, to the current government, they get 150 million billion forints. I hope you understand the symbol of these two amounts of money. It's very unequal situation. We think that the EU has to create means for direct application for funds for regions and the city councils that can be used to gain financial independence. Thank you. Thank you very much also for being synthetic and um... I think it's very clear that you don't need from, from what Esther and you have told us that you don't need a you don't need a formal system of citizenship. There are many ways in which you can curtail uh, dissenting voices, as you said, the theaters that are close to the party in power or, or the currents that are close to them. And uh, and uh, this is possible in many, you know, um, subtle ways, as you have described, to limit artistic freedom and to advance this so-called uh, agenda for an illiberal democracy. No? So thank you. I don't know if we can have now uh, Esrirak uh, with us. Esrirak, can you hear me? Can you hear and see me okay? Yes, yes, please. So okay. Esrirak Plipat, as I said before, is the executive director of Free Muse. And uh, I think uh, you can give us a good overview of the situation of artistic freedom in Europe as a whole, and the latest uh, developments in the different legal frameworks at the EU level. You have the floor. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you for Socialist and Democrats group for inviting us here. It's a real pleasure to be able to join this important event. Um, let me start by saying, um, I'm going to outline some of the, the key findings of the report that Freemuse has done. Uh, we have monitored artistic freedom in Europe and uh, the whole world. In the last several years, uh, we published a report last year, which documents all uh, those that we could verify of censorships. Um, so there were 380 cases of violations of artistic freedom in Europe between 2018 and 19. It affects 809 artists uh, during these two years. And we are about to publish a new report in the next three days, actually. And that will cover all of the censorship that has been monitored around the world, including Europe. Um, overall, we've seen a broad uh, trend that things are getting worse very quickly, especially the last couple of years. Um, and last year was no exception. And actually, on the contrary to the general um, perception that because last year was the pandemic year, many arts and culture events have been cancelled and that censorship and other illegitimate forms of restriction must have uh, died out or being uh, reduced down. Uh, research findings show the opposite. Um, we found there are record high number of restriction of artistic freedom during the pandemic year. Um, for Europe in particular, um, in line with uh, other region, uh, artists continue to suffer because they criticize and oppose government policy and practices. And this comes through particular three broad sets of laws. And I would say these three sets of law, the very first one is when government go after artists in the name of insulting head of states and state symbols. 
Um, it should be made clear that um, these laws are inconsistent with international and regional human rights standards in the first place. Heads of states, prime minister, presidents, and the other who hold office are subject to scrutiny under a democratic principle. They can be criticized, um, yet these laws that protect heads of state still exist in 19 countries, including 13 in the EU itself. Um, secondly, the laws related to anti-terrorism. Um, these laws are supposed to keep us safe, but very often we found this law has been misused against those that oppose government's policy, especially minorities. Um, this is still widely practiced. It accounts to about 12% of all the prosecution cases against artists. And then thirdly, on hurting religious feeling, as Dominic mentioned, um, this has been practiced very widely and still exists in most countries in the EU. Um, UN and European human rights experts has made it very clear that we cannot use hurting religious feeling as the excuse for limiting freedom of expression. Um, the protection of uh, artistic freedom is to protect individuals, not ideology. And as I mentioned, the new report, the new findings, we see continued deterioration uh, in Europe. Uh, the new report, which we're going to share at, uh, in Berlin, or launch in Berlin in three days, we found that Europe is now the region with second highest in terms of imprisoning artists only after the Middle East and North Africa region. Europe also will now become the second, the region with second highest cases on prosecuting artists, that second highest only after Africa. Um, so these uh, basically show the, the hard fact of the need for um, all of us to really act very quickly to address these, these challenges. And very quickly, I just want to point three points on what can be done. And the very first one is we need to learn from protection of journalists. Um, journalists and the media freedom, the session an hour ago has shown that they've made good progress compared to protection of artists. At UNESCO two years ago, there's been conversation whether we should have a UN, a UNESCO action plan to protect artists and the audiences. Uh, this plan hasn't been followed up while well, there's a UN action plan to protect journalists. So there's uh, something that we could learn and EU is in a good position to take the lead in this role, given that this is not going to be taken forward by UNESCO as we speak. Uh, following what um, uh, Sweden has done in terms of defending uh, free speech, and this will give us uh, the EU a good opportunity to drive this forward. Um, secondly, uh, the European Commission is going to organize a workshop or conference on artistic freedom. And it is important to use this opportunity to really go far enough to discuss the very essence, the very issues that we are facing here. And this including cases of uh, prosecution, reform of laws. Um, a few countries has now accepted to change laws related to freedom of expression. And we look forward to follow up on these particular practices. And then finally, um, there's um, a new policy, a resolution on cultural recovery of Europe. And this is a very welcome re resolution from the European Parliament in September last year. It is really important that this is implementing with a sense of urgency, uh, really bring in line that protection of artists must be at a similar level with protection of journalists. Um, we still, uh, artists do lack uh, platforms for them to actually discuss uh, the common challenges they are facing. And I think the funding for artistic freedom remain a big part that this have to be more than artistic project, but also to cover artistic freedom, including um, monitoring research, uh, bringing good practices and share those experience will be, uh, very, will be very useful. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Esrirak, also for keeping with the time. Uh, the numbers and trends that you present are certainly cause of concern and redouble our, commi our commitment to act. Given the recent developments of the diverse legal, legal framework, the Commission and the um, fundamental rights agencies should monitor this area much more closely. And we will certainly do our part to raise awareness. And I think you raised, Esrirak, uh, a very good point. I think 
uh, we can take inspiration in the work done to, to protect uh, journalism and journalists in the, in the field of artistic uh, freedom. Now I'd like to give the floor to Clement Dvornik. Uh, Clement is the chairman of the Slovenian Federation of Filmmakers uh, Guilds and um, uh, he will um, report to us on the ongoing situation of the Slovenian film community and its current uh, sustainability. So please, um, Mr. Dvornik, if you are connected, which I yes. hope, the floor is... Okay, great. The floor is yours. Thank you for having me uh, today on this panel to present the situation that uh, occurred in last year in Slovenia. I should also point out that I'm also uh, chair of uh, Federation of European Screen Directors, uh, which is a European organization um, that connects 35 organizations in uh, 48 organizations from 35 countries. Um, but here today I would like to present the situation uh, of audiovisual community in Slovenia. Um, in 2020, um, when pandemic hit, uh, at the beginning of pandemic, there was also a change of uh, government in Slovenia. Uh, left center uh, government was uh, replaced by uh, center right government. Uh, that was where the majority uh, is uh, held by the party of Slovenian Prime Minister Janis Janša, and. The new government, um, uh, in, to be fair, uh, inherited the situation that was created in, uh, with the previous government, um, which was one bureaucratic, I, I should say, um, mistake or uh, not, not a good solution, how to finance Slovenian film. Um, and this situation that was inherited, uh, the new government uh, used and abused uh, in next nine months, um, directly choking the financing of Slovenian uh, film agency, that is the basically the largest and almost the sole financier of um, national film or uh, complex films or cinematic films or uh, audiovisual, audiovisual content at large. So, uh, the situation got worse uh, in, uh, in, in summer, where, where uh, my organization, Association of Filmmakers Guilds, uh, that is also composed of basically all the representative organizations in, in, in the country that uh, uh, connect people with, from the audiovisual sector, we started working on communicating with the government that the situation is... Uh, unsustainable, that in the time of pandemic where, where um, all the people who were uh, who are basically freelanced became, uh, became big uh, economic and so uh, like uh, got a big economic problem uh, because work stopped, there wasn't any job in the market. Uh, there wasn't any job uh, that was that was previously created by the um, public fin financing. So when we started uh, researching what happened, we discovered that there was um, basically unwillingness and the, the, the bureaucratic system that was used to, to economically choke or economically censor the whole audiovisual community, which uh, was... Uh, uh, preserve, uh, pre the, the perception of, of uh, audiovisual community was basically that we were um, somehow um, the threats to uh, threats to I don't know values of uh, Slovenian traditional values. But nevertheless, the idea uh, uh, that uh, that we shouldn't be financed. Uh, and the, 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 this economic choke lasted for nine months. Uh, even after heavy uh, international in, uh, um, support that we got all, also from Brussels and from other European countries, um, it didn't, uh, the government wasn't, uh, wasn't uh, prepared to 
solve uh, quickly solve the problem. And it was solved basically on the last day, five minutes to twelve, when uh, when majority of money was was um, uh, uh, paid out to the film agency. Uh, that means literally on eleven fifty five, it was put on on their account on thirty first of December, uh, which was the last day of the year. Mm. This solution was provided only because of um, the coalition partners uh, of uh, governing party, uh, the liberals and the other EPP party in Slovenia, Christian Democrats, uh, heavily insisted that this should be solved uh, in a way that is written in the law. And the situation was solved in a way that uh, the minimum, minimum requirement was met. Um, for the future, for the year 21 and ahead, we see a lot of roadblocks uh, in front of us. Government is now preparing um, the change of um, the law that, that, that establishes financing on, of audiovisual sector. Uh, also, the implementation of the, of the AVMS directive will be used um, or it's intended to be used in a way that government would uh, heavily, uh, heavily um, control the resources that would that will that will be um, paid in by the by the platforms or uh, also by the all the providers of audiovisual content. And um, uh, right now, the uh, the supervising board um, that. Uh, which uh, uh, their mandate ended in, in on 11th of February is hanging. We have no board of film agency, and uh, that means that film agency right now is unoperational. That means that all uh, again all the all the mm, uh, tasks uh, of financing uh, public financing of uh, audiovisual sector is held again. Um, so that is. I mean, you, you have to. Yeah, you have to wrap it up. Question. So, uh, the future is not uh, is not set, and the system is really unstable. And what should be done is to to the system to to make it more stable, and uh, to be less less um, affected by political changes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, that's um, that's very well understood and. Uh, we know uh, this is also in connection with the point that uh, was raised before um, by Laszlo regarding the discretionality in funding for, for cultural activities. So uh, I think that the Slovenian case is very telling no? of, what, uh, of what we're talking about. So now, uh, so thank you very much, uh, Clement, also for, for sticking to the time. Uh, very good testimony and we're going now to and of course you, you may have the chance all of you to come back later on with um, with the questions from the audience but f let's start with Tere Badia who is our discussant um, so um, Tere uh, the, the floor is yours for yours for a couple of minutes yes thank you very much uh, Dominic um, and thank you for all the panelists for, for the interesting, very interesting uh, inputs in, in, in the discussion. So, yeah, Culture Action Europe has been working at this topic since uh, 2012. It's a while. Uh, in the last years, we have seen that it, there, is, there is an increase of, 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 of yeah, uh, this topic. It's going to be, it's, it's being um, a, a huge issue also in the European Union. We act uh, in, a, in the European Union. So for us, it's a crucial topic. Uh, since 2018, we have a specific working group on this topic and this uh, freedom of artistic expression. And we are also trying to collaborate and, 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 in, uh, and work in close contact with the Commission, the Parliament, and uh, to bring this, uh, freedom of artistic expression high in the European agenda. Specifically, on the topic, but also including it in when we advocate for better working conditions of artists and cultural workers, because we consider that uh, freedom of artistic expression is part of the working conditions. It's part of the the the, the best way to develop the work of, of the artists and the cultural agents. So my comments and, and questions. So this is this is a burning topic right now. Uh, you, you, it was mentioned before, and and and. and it, 
it's uh, this case this that is making the headlines in these days all over Europe, the case of Pablo Hassel, who is in jail for, and uh, I'm quoting, glorifying terrorism and slandering the crown and state institutions over lyrics and tweets. And um, well, beyond going in deep in the in the in the, in the legal <laughs> issue, I, I, it was very surprised because I asked about this case, the European Commission answered that it goes beyond the EU's competence, the European Union competence, being this a question of uh, member states' competence. So yes, uh, it is like this, but we see freedom of artistic expression as part of the fundamental European cultural, political, and social values. So, and these values are paramount in the European project. Uh, they are being challenged. Uh, you have, we have heard now, we have been hearing this uh, since, since a while now. Uh, we have seen and we have read uh, and heard uh, Sridak Pripat, uh, presenting the, 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 the results of, of, of the free news study. So this, we think that this is really something that uh, should uh, worry the European institutions and should call them for, for, for the action. So furthermore, uh, one of the main needs uh, we think of first prosecuted artists is legal certainty to be able to develop their work. And we know, as, as we, can, we can see this in many, many cases, in respect of freedom of artistic expression and its alleged, alleged abuses, most courts tend to adjudicate in an intuitive and case-by-case -case manner. And this results in a legal uncertainty. I think or we think that to help clear these uncertainties, we need instruments at EU level, whereby artistic freedom can be monitored and assessed. And this is crucial to any possible future policy action or legal action of the, on the union level, especially as only very few cases of this alleged constraints on the freedom of artistic freedom are presented in front of the EU treaty bodies or the European Court, or Court of Human Rights. So together with uh, Freemius, uh, we called on the introduction of an indicator about artistic freedom, for example, in the assessment on, on, of the reaches of the rule of, of law uh, in the member states, so Article 7 at the end. Another tool could be the development of an European handbook uh, on the legal framework relevant to all member states, as it was developed by, by FRA regarding uh, the non-discrimination law. And this handbook could include and should include general indicators that could enable the artistic community and the cultural sector to monitor the state of artistic freedom across the European Union in a more transparent way and more standard way, let's say so. But for any have, legal action... Tere, you have to wrap it up. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Just, just to include, but because I think that uh, to, 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 for any legal actions to be, and, to, and, and to be meaningful and proportional and, and efficient, it, it needs to be based on the factual realities of the artistic communities. And therefore, we need to include the artistic community in the development of these instruments. So these are two proposals. But uh, my question is, and I'm, 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 I'm asking Esther and Clement and also Sridak, uh, are there other tools or actions that should be activated at EU level, counting with the participation of the cultural and creative sectors? Okay, thank you, Terry. I think uh, you have uh, dwelled into a uh, very important question of, of the limits of the freedom of uh, uh, artistic expression. Even if I have to say that on my own behalf, I, I don't think the case of Pablo Hassel uh, is the best one because we cannot make I think him the poster child from artistic freedom when his lyrics celebrate or call for, uh, he says he's happy to see uh, politicians he doesn't like dead and things like that, or, or to say that terrorism is cool. I think we will be confused in the debate if we think that hate speech is included in artistic freedom. Even if, even if of course, it's very difficult to establish the right limits. Huh? But I, I think there are probably better examples um, of um, heroes of freedom of expression and, and, and freedom of uh, artistic uh, or artistic freedom. But precisely the public has um, also asked about uh, things like that. And we got the first one that says, and I direct this to the panelists, uh, totalitarian regimes hide the silencing of any kind of artistic expression behind hate speech and defamation. How do we clearly state the difference between free speech and hate speech so we can eliminate this problem once and forever? 
who of the panelists would like to address this topic? I can uh, give it a go if you like. Yes, please, Rirak, go ahead. Okay, thank you very much. Um, thank you for the for the question. I think it's, it's very important to to make distinction. Um, we, as we defend uh, artistic freedom, obviously we do not defend hate speech. So that's the the important part of making uh, distinction. And the distinction has to be made and be based on European and international human rights law. So um, we cannot just use our um, personal judgment. Um, so for anything to constitute hate speech, you need to have two components. Mainly the first one is hate, and the second one is the expression of the speech. And you have to pass five tests in order to conclude that something um, is uh, a hate speech. And these tests, including the context of how it is said, the likelihood whether people will follow suit, whether this is musician sing something, um, and whether the audience are likely to do it, um, and also other political elements that we need to take into consideration, the necessity, the proportionality, um, and the degree of the incitement of violence. So there's some technicality of it before anything can be included at hate speech. And I think it's important for us also not to mix it up with something that we feel very tasteless, uh, some of the uh, music songs um, that we basically disagree with and we think it's, it's not a very tasteful expression of uh, artistic. Uh, it's also important for us to make sure that we remind ourselves that it is also our role to protect expressions even when we disagree with them or put it more bluntly, even when we disagree with them, they perhaps would need to be protected first, mainly because we disagree with them to make sure that uh, we, we protect everyone's right to, to that. Uh, if possible, I'd like to respond to uh, Terry questions on the, the what else that can be done. And I certainly see two tracks here. I think one is the, the need to address legal framework that uh, EU member states still have um, challenges on. Uh, and the other part is you know, not only change the, the law, the legal framework, it has the government have to come up with action plan to protect artists. And Sweden has set an example already in terms of protecting by developing a national action plan. And I think this is where the European level can come up with this action plan and engage with the member states. Uh, and this way we can bring the conversation into a positive, constructive, uh, avoid a situation where you point fingers to member states and I know many of us have been a bit nervous on that front but without addressing finding way to to do it constructively it will be difficult for us so I think both the preventive side as well as the one that governments and Euro the EU has to take action in order to improve, improve protection initiatives like SLAP that's been mentioned a while ago uh, to protect artists from being sued uh, is very much needed. Our research report we're going to uh, make public in three days show that last year, 2020, the number of prosecution of artists has increased by four times. That's come to compare 2020 to 2019. That's four times. Um, it is a, a big surprise to many of us and 45% of them are related to COVID-19 in particular. Um, but those are some of the mechanisms I think that's really need to be addressed. Thank you very much, Esridak. Um, I don't know if uh, the other panelists would like to, to comment on this. No? Okay, well, uh, I also agree with Tere, by the way, that the question of media and artistic freedom uh, should be looked up in the context of the rule of law monitoring, and I'm sure we will we will be noting that in the in the report that we will be crafting um, in the in the coming days and, and weeks. I, I happen to be the reporter for that file, so I'll be uh, taking that very much uh, into account. And now is my um, my pleasure to introduce uh, the vice president of the European Parliament and colleague of. Uh, the SD group, Clara Dobrev, also a member of the LIBE committee, uh, for uh, wrapping up the, the conference. So please, Clara. Thank you. Thank Welcome. you very much, Dominic. 
Uh, and thank you for all of you participating in this debate because I think it's an utmost importance. Listening to you, I just brought back some memories from 25 or 30 years ago. I would like to ask you just to think back as well. This were, this were the 90s or middle of the 90s, after the changes, defeating the communist regime in Eastern Europe. And we all thought that democracy, human rights, rule of law, it's simply so obvious for everyone that we won the battle. We won the historic battle and now our task is for, for generation to after us as well, is just simply to make our life better because we do agree on the basic uh, pillars of our democracies. And this was 30 years ago. And then we thought, end of history, you remember this sentence. Liberal democracies are winning. We don't have too much to do on this item. But then came a very, very terrible surprise. The surprise that if Democrats fall asleep in democracy, they might wake up in dictatorship. That happened to my own country, Hungary, and that happened to Poland as well. But it's not only about Hungary and Poland only. We realized in the past few years that illiberal democracies, dictators, autocrats are growing in Europe. We are not talking about faraway countries in Africa and Asia or South America. We are talking about a continent where democracy was born. Do we have the legitimacy to talk about human rights violation in Asia or Africa when we cannot protect our own democracy in Europe? This is the number one question for the upcoming years. And yes, as you could see, illiberal dictators and autocrats, the first one they attacked is free media and freedom of art. Because we say that democracy is a set of institutions that enable human beings to make social choices. But to make social choices, you need to have information, knowledge. And this is what is coming to the people through media and through art. Individuals can make clever social choices if they hear the different arguments, if they are provided with different perspectives and views. And that's exactly freedom of media and freedom of art. Art and media are giving different interpretation, explanation about the world around us. And that is what is enabling to make a democracy. Without freedom of media and freedom of art, there is no democracy. I would even say the sentence, there is no legitimate government because there are no free elections, no free and fair elections without the freedom of media and freedom of art. So the question is, what can, can we do? And um, I am a person who is optimistic. I see the task, it's a huge task in front of us, but we have the tools because we have learned the lesson. Unfortunately, it was a painful lesson for the past years, but we have learned it. So the task is to unite our forces and to see how can we defeat our democracy, our freedom of media and freedom of speech. And first of all, we call, and the socialists and Democrats were the first one to call years ago to have a precise mechanism to protect rule of law, to protect free media pluralism, to protect freedom of art, to protect human rights. And we need a very strict uh, monitoring and intervention mechanism for the freedom of media. We have measures uh, uh, implemented already, acts, directives. We have to make it much more better. We have to implement them much more effectively in the next few years. And we have the new mechanism, rule of law. And we call the commission as socialists and democrats uh, that to use it. We are talking a lot about the protection of the financial interest of the European Union. I've talked about democracy, protecting democracy now. Let's have a look at the protection of the financial interest. I can tell you there is no fight against corruption without the freedom of media. Unfortunately, Slovakia or even Malta had a very painful example for that. You cannot fight corruption, you cannot fight oligarchs if you don't have a free media. This is a task ahead of us for the next year as well. And we have Article 7 for those countries 
who are violating democracy, who are violating human rights and rule of law and freedom of media and art. And we have to use it. And we have to use it because we are in the last year or two. As I told you, it's not only about Hungary and Poland. Hungary and Poland are the examples, but illiberal Democrats learn from each other. Illiberal Democrats are preparing themselves. You just have to look at Bulgaria, you just have to look at Slovenia, as we heard in the discussion as well earlier. But you should look in any other country. Far-right extremists in Spain, in Austria, in Germany, in Sweden, and you name it, they are preparing themselves as well, and they are learning from each other. And if we are weak and we are not able to protect ourselves, then watch Hungary and watch Poland. To get back our country, it's much more difficult than not to lose it. As a Hungarian MEP, I would suggest to all my fellow Democrats around Europe, protect your democracy, because now we are harding very hard to get it back. We are going to get, back, to get it back, but you should never lose it. And thank you very much for participating in this discussion. Thank you.